this morning in Revelation chapter 20. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 20 this morning. <clears throat> There's a Bible Institute test today on Paul's church epistles. night from how to study the Bible if you're part of that class All right Revelation chapter 20 we're going to read several verses here I'm sorry what brother I'm not on ah how about now thought JD had gotten real spiritual for a minute wanted to stand up and shout or testify or something he was just telling me I wasn't plugged in that's that's a blessing amen Revelation chapter 20, I'll read a couple of verses, several verses here, and we'll see how far we get this morning. The Bible says in verse number 1, Revelation 20, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark in their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years." And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters, quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that we're able to be here again today. Thank you for the good singing, the good fellowship. I do pray now that you will help us. I pray that you will use us to be an encouragement a blessing to your people. Pray you'd help us to speak the truth and to speak that truth in love. And I pray that you would help us, Lord, to preach with power and compassion and conviction. I pray you would speak to folks' heart. Lord, if there's someone here today that's not saved or not sure of their salvation, I pray that you would help them to have a desire to get that settled today. And I pray that we as God's people would get our mind and our focus and our thoughts and our attention off of all the distractions that are so easily besetting us today. And look squarely into the Word of God and put our faith and our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. For that we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. In chapter number 20, it begins, John said, And I saw an angel come down from heaven. Now, the chronological sequence or the order of events, if you want to put it that way, which marked the conclusion of God's program concerning time and the passage into eternity are set forth by what John saw in these passages of Scripture. We're going to look at them quickly. We're going to look at a lot of places today in the Bible. And just now, these are not all the things that John saw, but we can see in these last few chapters here in the Bible that the things that John saw led to these events from, from as I mentioned, the passage of time into eternity. Look, if you will, look backwards, if you will, to chapter 19 for just a moment. He said in verse number 11, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. So John saw in Revelation chapter 9 and verse number 11, he saw the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are several things. That, that's the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are several things that he saw between that time and the beginning of the millennial kingdom. Look what he saw. Look at verse 17. He said, and I saw an angel 
standing in the sun. So he saw an angel give an invitation to the supper of the great God, the Bible says there in that verse of Scripture. Now look at verse number 19. And I saw the beast. If we read all of that, it said, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So he saw the return of the Lord. He saw the invitation to the supper of the great God. He saw the beast and the false prophet cast into the lake of fire, and he saw the remnant of the armies destroyed with the sword of his mouth, which is the word of God. Now, here in our text verse, in verse number 20, the next thing he saw right before the beginning of the millennium is he saw the binding of Satan and him being cast into the bottomless pit. Now, so all of those things that happened before the establishment of the millennial kingdom. The reason we're talking about that is chapter 20 has to do with the millennial reign. Now, in verse number 20, we see some things, something that happened in the millennial kingdom. Look what he saw, verse number 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. So he saw the great white throne, and he saw thrones where individuals are going to be placed upon. Now, after, after the millennial kingdom, he's going to see some things as well that move us into eternity. Look at verse number 11. Verse number 11. And I saw a great white throne. I, I'm sorry, I mentioned that as well ago. In, in chapter 20, verse number 4, what he saw was the reign of Christ and his saints. Christ reigned upon the throne and saints reigned upon thrones. I realize I said the great white throne just a moment ago. He saw here in verse number 11 a great white throne and him that sat upon it. So after the millennium, he sees the great white throne. Verses 12 tell us, look at verses 12. Through 14, it says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. <coughs> Excuse me. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to his works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So he saw in these verses of Scripture, verses 12 through 14, he saw the dead, he, smalled, he saw the books, and he saw the lake of fire. Now, look at this. In, verse number tw in chapter 21, chapter 21, look what he saw. Verse number 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. So in chapter 21, he saw a new heaven and a new earth. Look, he saw again in verse number 2, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. Aren't you excited about seeing a holy city? There's, there's, I don't know of any holy cities today, but one of these days there's going to be a holy city. What a blessing. John said, after this millennium, I saw, I saw the great white throne. I saw the dead and the books and the lake of fire. I saw a new heaven and I saw a new earth and I saw a holy city. There's one more. Look at verse 22. Look at verse 22, still in chapter 21. Now, he, he sees this holy city, New Jerusalem, and he saw something that caught his attention in there. In verse number 22, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Amen. And so what a great blessing. So these are the things that John saw. This is a chronological sequence or an order of events that John saw taking us from the time, from the period of time into eternity. Now, come back to verse, verse number 1, Revelation chapter 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit. I didn't, I didn't write this down, but I just thought about this. Hold your place here and come back with to Revelation chapter 1 for just a moment. Revelation chapter 1. Let me see if I can find this here. Look at verse number 18. We'll read verse 17. 
And when I saw him, so John seeing the uh, vision of the pre-incarnate Christ, he said, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, said unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. So the Lord Jesus Christ, he has the keys. He gives those to one of his angels. And the Bible says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And so the Lord summons this angel. He comes down from heaven. He has the key to the bottomless pit. He has a great chain in his hand, and he's going to bind Satan. Ain't that a blessing? Now, this great chain, devils, come to Mark chapter 5. Hold your place here for a moment, and come to Mark chapter number 5. Devils may be able to, and we'll see evidence of that here in Mark chapter 5, break human chains. They'll not be able to break God's chains. Look at this in in Mark chapter 5. Look at verse number 1. You know the story, the demonic from Gadaria. The Bible said, And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadareans. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him. No, look what it says, not with chains because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. So here is this demonic. He is demon-possessed with unclean spirits. Man cannot tame him. Man cannot bind him. They put fetters on him. They put chains on him. And he simply broke the chains asunder. The Bible said that he plucked. they were plucked asunder by him. He could not be restrained and he could not be tamed. But they didn't have the great chain that God has. Amen. Now, in fact, look at this. Come to Jude. Jude is the little book right before Revelation. And look at verse number 6. Look at a couple of places. Look at Jude, verse number 6. Devils may break human chains, but not those that are forged by God. The Bible says in verse number 6 of the book of Jude, And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. So those fallen angels, they are in everlasting chains reserved under the day of judgment, uh, uh, under darkness, under that great day of judgment. Now, here's something. Look, Come back to Revelation for just a moment. I want you to look at something. Look here. I, I read it already. In verse number 17 of chapter 19, The Bible says, come and gather yourselves together under the supper. Notice what it said, of the great God. Now, look at chapter 12. Look at chapter 12 for just a moment. Chapter 12, Revelation. Where the Bible says in verse number 9. Chapter 12, verse number 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan which deceived the whole world. So we have a great God in Revelation 19, 17. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 12 and verse number 9 that there is a great dragon, that's Satan, but God has a great chain. He is a great God and he has a great chain that is capable of capturing and keeping a great devil. Amen? Now, so what a blessing. I'm glad that God is able to bind him. Now, the devil is a spiritual being. So this is a literal chain, but it is not a physical chain. Let me put it like this. In other words, it is a real chain, but it is not a chain that you can see and feel. There's a lot of things that are real that you cannot see or cannot feel. Now, here, look at this. Come to 2 Peter chapter number 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. By the way, we're going to do a lot of turning today, if I haven't said that already. As far as the teaching part, Bible Institute is over. I can slow down. Second Peter, look at chapter, not that I did not thoroughly enjoy Bible Institute. Amen. Looking forward to getting that started again. So God has a chain that is capable of chaining spiritual beings. Look what the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, let me just say this right here. If God didn't spare the angels that sinned, and the Bible plainly says that we're made a little lower than angels, He's not going to spare you that sin either. 
Amen. So if God spared not the angels, unless you repent and receive the Lord Jesus Christ, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. So God has a chain completely capable of chaining the demons and the devils that are evil. Now come back to Revelation 20. We'll look at verse number 1 again. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. I guess the, the best explanation that I've heard or that I could give you for a bottomless pit is that there is a hole in the center of the earth and there's absolutely no gravity in that hole at all. So as the earth rotates, you are continuously falling into this bottomless pit. You're just rolling over and over. And oh, I, I don't know if you've ever, I'm weird, I know that. You ever dreamed you were falling and you woke up on the floor? I hope you haven't. I've done that a few times. But there, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing worse than thinking that you are falling. And so forever, I mean, I'm, throughout, you're, you're in hell, a place that is a bottomless pit, and as the earth rotates, you're just continually falling in that bottomless pit. What a horrible, horrible thing. Now, look at verse number 2. Verse number 2. And he laid hold on the dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Now, here in verse number 2, we have, we have all the names, or at least four names mentioned for for Christ, for God's great arch enemy, the dragon, the serpent, the devil, Satan. And uh, so listen, he, he's far more than just some powerful force for uh, the fact that he is bound. We understand that he is a person. The Bible says here, we'll read the verse again, and laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Now, there is an overwhelming majority of the world today that is fascinated with crime and criminals and the arrest of criminals. And here we have the, the greatest criminal in all the world, the most vicious criminal, the most ruthless criminal, the, the most devastating criminal of all time. And he is being arrested by a great God and he is being uh, contained by a great chain from a great God and so what a blessing it is. Look, this is a, this is a speedy trial. In fact, there's no, not even a mention of the trial in the Bible. He is arrested, he is bound, and he is cast into the bottomless pit. He said, well, that ain't, that ain't fire. There should have been a trial. When the God of all the earth that knows right and does right and knows the very thoughts and intents of our heart, he knows everything that Satan is guilty of. There's no reason to have a trial. You are arrested, you are bound, and you are sentenced by the same captor, and that is God. And so what a blessing to know that this, this deviant is going to be bound for a thousand years. Now, if we use just a little bit of logic here, if the devil one day in the future is going to be bound it is certainly obvious that he is not bound now. Correct? If he, if he is going to be bound, it is just quite obvious that he is not already bound. So here, here we have, we have this charismatic crowd, and they're always talking about binding Satan. Like some of them are so bold as to say, well, you, you don't have to worry about Satan. You don't have to worry about that devil because he's a defeated foe. He can't do anything to you anyway. Uh, he's already defeated. But listen, don't, don't talk like a foolish person. And don't be, don't be ignorant of what the Bible teaches. He is not yet bound. And I promise you, you're not going to bind him. Amen. Now, let, let's look at several places in Scripture. Hold your places here in Revelation 20, and come all the way, you'll recognize the passages, but we're going to read them anyway. Come all the way to Job chapter number 1. Job chapter number 1. Satan is not bound today, and you are not capable of binding him. The Bible says in the, in the book of Job chapter number 1, look at verse number 6. The Bible says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, 
and Satan came also among them. So it's obvious he's not bound. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. So it's quite obvious that Satan isn't bound here. Now come to Job chapter number 2. Job chapter 2. Verse number 1 again. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence cometh thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Again, it is very obvious from this passage of Scripture that Satan is not bound. Now, you say, well, preacher, all of that, all of that is in the Old Testament. And we understand that he was not bound then, but we're in the New Testament now. We're on the other side of the cross. So that passage in Job, it don't count. He is bound now. No, no, he's not. Come to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter number 1. First Peter chapter number 1, you probably recognize this verse of Scripture as well. Verse number 8. The Bible says to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, look what it says, walketh about. So he, he's, obviously he's not bound if he's walking about. He's walking about seeking whom he may devour. Now, there's a lot of, a lot of things that we could read, a lot of places we can read. I'm not going to turn to all these places and read them, but I'll give you the reference for them, and, I, and I'll, I'll give you some things for them. So during this church age... Satan is actively involved in several different ways trying to hinder the Christian and trying to dis- destroy the saved and the lost alike. He, he want, listen, if you've been born again, uh, Satan knows that he can't have your soul, but that doesn't mean he doesn't want to destroy your life, your testimony, your ministry. He wants to render you completely ineffective in the work of Christ. And if you're lost... He's doing everything in his power to keep you that way so that you can join him in the pit one day. He he don't have any good plans for you. The Bible says he came to kill, steal, and destroy. And that's exactly what he came to do. So listen, here's what he's doing. In Acts chapter 5, you know the story of Ananias and Sapphire. He is filling the hearts of church members to lie. That's what he did with Ananias and Sapphire. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the Bible tells us in verses 3 and 4 that he is binding the minds or, or blinding the minds of sinners. Oftentimes we, we can see because the Lord has given us some spiritual insight and we, we look at people's lives and we're like, what in the world are they thinking? They're, they're, they're not. Their minds are blinded by Satan. It's very obvious from this side of salvation, not so much so from the other side, but he is blinding the minds of sinners. Now, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 that he is deceiving believers, and he is certainly good at that, deceiving believers. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 8, he is hindering God's servants. Paul, on a couple occasions there in that passage of scriptures in 1 Thessalonians, He had desired to be at the church of Thessalonica, but he was hindered once and again, the Bible says, from going there. And so I I think, I personally think, or it seems to me anyway, I'll say it like that, that many of God's missionaries today are being hindered from getting to the place that they would like to be or desire to be to serve the Lord, but they're being hindered from getting there. Not anything new. Satan has done that in the past, and he's continuing to do that even today. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 26 tells us that he is taking men captive at his will. Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 10, he throws Christians into prison. Now, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I, I hate to continue to be critical. I, I understand that there are circumstances and situations. I know that. I, I know that, and I get that. But there's a lot of people who have quickly and easily given in to a pandemic and a sickness and a government and completely given up on God. If you think, you, look, you won't stand for God today. You think you're going to stand for God when you're cast into prison? I doubt it. So he, he's, he throws Christians into prison. Now, 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, he destroys the flesh of believers. You know the story there in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the, the uh, wicked sin that was there. And the Lord said he'd turn them over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. What a horrible thing. Could you, can you imagine what a horrible thing? Listen, you say, well, that was, that was then. Listen, it can happen today. I believe it does still happen today. We, 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 we blame a lot of things. You know, we have a, and I thank God for doctors. If I need a doctor, I, I am not so spiritual that I am not going. If I need one, I promise you I'm going. And if he prescribes me something to take, I'm going to take it. Amen? I want to tell you something. We have, because of our medical advancement, we have completely turned everything over to coincidence and doctors and not realized that because of people's disobedience to God and their desire to live after the flesh and not to live according to what God says they should live, lots of times their flesh gets turned over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. You believe John 3.16, why don't you believe 1 Corinthians chapter 5? It's in the same Bible, written by the same God. Amen. Satan destroys the flesh of believers. The Bible tells us, we read the passage in 1 Peter 5, 8, he walks through the earth as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He doesn't care if you're a believer or not. He wants to destroy your life. Now, come to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. Good encouraging Thanksgiving message this morning. You say, preacher, I, I wanted to hear something. Th Listen, I am thankful that Satan's going to be bound. I am thankful that he's going to be bound for a thousand years. I am thankful that I'm not going to hell with him, amen. I am thankful that Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign from the throne of David on this earth for a thousand years, and I'm going to rule and reign with him. I'm thankful for that. There's your Thanksgiving message. Amen. Ain't that a blessing? We got many things to be thankful for. Praise the Lord. Look at it. I'm thankful for this. Look at James chapter 4. Where is James? Here it is. It's after Peter. James chapter 4. I mean before Peter. It's still in my Bible somewhere. Here it is. It's after Hebrews, before Peter. If it's after Peter in your Bible, I don't know what kind of Bible you have. It was, that was a test. You passed. That's J.D. saying right there. James chapter 4. Look what the Bible says. Listen. Listen, Satan is doing all of these things. He's involved in all of these. He's active in all these things during the church age. But he can be resisted. He can be resisted. Look what the Bible says in James chapter 4, verse number 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now listen, when Satan comes seeking to devour you, and he does that quite often... If you will submit yourselves to God, He will flee from you. Now, the Bible plainly tells us there's some things that we should flee from. We should flee from fornication. We should flee from youthful lust. But we're not to flee from the devil. We're to submit ourselves to God, and He will flee from us. Now, the word submit means to yield to or to surrender to the power of another. So if, if you're submitted to your flesh... If you're submitted to your desire to live the way you want to live and do what you want to do, as opposed to being obedient to God, you're submitted to your will instead of submitted to God's will. He's not going to flee from you. He's going to devour you. Amen. So God help us to submit to God's will. Now look at Ephesians chapter 6. So if we resist him, if we submit ourselves to God and resist the devil, he'll flee from us. Look at this. We can stand, we can stand against Satan if we put on the whole armor of God. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So the Satan is full of trickery, he's full of deception. And he'll do everything, the wiles of the devil, he'll do everything he can to trick us and to deceive us. And we can stand against him if we put on the whole armor of God. Now, we are, we are living in a time when so many, so many church members are, they're confused about Satan. And uh, he, he never has been bound and he's not going to be bound until this angel comes and binds him in Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 1. 
Now, we're told here about the devil is bound for a thousand years, and we call that period the millennium. And verses 1 through 7 here in this chapter talk about the millennium. Now, during the millennium, Satan himself, the devil himself, is not present upon this earth messing people up. So some folks seem to think automatically that because of that, that all during the millennium, there's just going to be perfect peace. However, Satan is not the only cause of trouble in this world. He's not the only cause of problems in this world. In fact, the Ephesians chapter 2, as well as the book of 1 John, talks about three sources of trouble, the world, the devil, and the flesh. So if the devil being bound meant that the earth was going to enjoy complete peace and all of that during the millennium, then why is God going to have to rule with a rod of iron? The very fact that he's going to rule with a rod of iron proves that there's going to be much rebellion and much disobedience during the millennium. And we'll read some about that here in just a little bit. But the Bible talks about in Revelation chapter 2, verse number 27, he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And then last week when we was in chapter 19, the Bible says there that he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And so it is obvious that the millennium is not going to be without rebellion and without disobedience, even though Satan is going to be bound. Now, look what the Bible says in verse number 3. We're back in Revelation chapter 20. And cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season." Now, so the Bible says and he cast him into the bottomless pit. So here at the very last, the, he's at the very, see, there, there's people today, they're preaching, you know, that this idea that um, we're going to prevail and Christianity's going to prevail and Satan's going to be brought down. Listen, he, he's not going to, if he's going to be at the height of his rebellion, He's going to be at the height of his disastrous ways. He's going to be at the very pinnacle of his rebellion towards God and his, his, his trying to destroy all of God's people. It's going to be at that time that he's going to be arrested. He's going to be brought down. He's going to be cast into the bottomless pit. Now, let's look what the Bible says about this. Hold your place here and come to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. He's going to be arrested. He's going to be cast into prison, into the bottomless pit. I don't want to go to prison, but I'm certainly glad I'll never go to that prison. Amen. Isaiah chapter 14. Let's read what the Bible has to say about this in the book of Isaiah. Now, I'll tell you this. We're going to start reading verse number 12 here in just a moment. But the first three verses that I'm going to read is going to tell you about Satan's past. They're going to reveal to you, these first three verses are, about Satan's heart condition, about his attitude, about his self-will, about his pride. Where the Bible says in verse 14, or verse number 12 of chapter 14, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. So in these three verses, just these three verses, there's other places in the Bible as well, we can see Satan's attitude in these verses of Scripture. He has this attitude, this mentality, I'm going to do as I please, never mind God. I'm going to do whatever I want to do, and it doesn't matter what God says about it. Now, unfortunately, that is the attitude of many people in the day that we live in. I don't want nobody ruling over me. I don't want nobody telling me what to do. I don't want a list of rules to go by. I don't want a list of laws that I need to abide by. I want to do whatever I want to do and live as lawless and ungodly as I want to live and do as I please, and nobody can do anything about it. Sir, ma'am, you are of your father, the devil. You are displaying his attitude. You are displaying his mentality. You are displaying his, his, uh, his, uh, uh, his attention towards God. You have no respect for him, no desire for him. We see that clearly in these verses of Scripture. Now, so that's Satan's past. Now, these next few verses, 
These next four verses that we're going to read are going to tell us about Satan's future. We talked about during our Bible Institute, the law of the gap. We see his past. We see his future here in these next verses. Look at verse number 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell. You see the end of verse 14? I will be like the Most High. No, you're going to be brought down to hell. <laughs> to the sides of the north. Now, this is where we're reading at in Revelation chapter 20, our text. Now, he says, And yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee. Who, who is they that are see? What is he talking Listen, I'll, I'll tell you this. These, these people here, they that see thee, this is, the in, this is the very conscience inhabitants of hell. Those who are already there, they're going to see you. Satan, you, you have placed yourself above God. You've exalted yourself to this position. But you're going to be cast down to hell. And those that are already in hell, they're going to see you when they get there. Now, look what they that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee. I want you to think about something. Hell, we don't usually preach from hell a whole lot from the Old Testament, but it's very clear here that those in hell are very conscious inhabitants. Those that are in hell, they can see, and they're, they're in their mind, there is functioning, and they're processing events that are going on while they're in the pits of hell where the fire never quenched and where the worm dieth not. Now, look at verse 17. Well, let me finish reading verse 16. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble and did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities therein, that opened not the house of his prisoners, so here the, the inhabitants of hell are astonished. They're, they're astonished at the sight of the one who has deceived them. And uh, they're astonished at the sight of the one that they have believed and that they have followed. You say, I don't believe Satan. I'm not following Satan. Listen, if you haven't believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and you're not following Him, you have believed Satan and you are following Him. And you're gonna, he's going to be cast into hell where you are one day if you don't get born again. Now... So if you're so foolish to think that you're going to hell to party and you're going to hell to have a good time, you are extremely deceived. If you think it's a good idea to serve Satan and live after the lust of the flesh and the desires of the flesh and the pleasure of this world, and you, you think it's cool that you don't have to follow the rules and you can do whatever you want to do, you're going to hell. And Satan is going to be cast there with you one day. And that's not a pleasant thing. Now, now, look, look, you, you, well, you know, I don't, ha I don't have to, you know, I can just do whatever I want to do. One of these days, notice what the end of verse 17 says. Let me read the verse again. That made the world a wilderness and destroyed the cities there. Now, look at this. That opened not the house of his prisoners. You think you're free to do whatever you want to do? You're going to go to hell and Satan is not going to open the house of his prisoners. His desire, you, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. I, I can live the way I want to. I do whatever I want to. I marry who I want to. I, I act like I want to. I do whatever I want to do. You better enjoy it. You're going to be a prisoner for all eternity. Separated from God. You, you ought to think about that this morning. That's not something you should take lightly. That is something you ought to consider deeply. Let me help you understand something. Rules are a good thing. Rules are for your good and your safety and your well-being. Laws are a good thing. They're for our safety. They're, our, they're for our benefit. Therefore, our well-being. You're on dangerous ground if you think it's a good idea to live lawlessly and ungodly and spend your life in disobedience to God doing as you please. You're, right. you're going to be a prisoner in hell until you're loosed for a little season to stand before God at the judgment seat of, at the great white throne judgment. And then you're going to be cast into the lake of fire for all eternity where the beast and the false prophet already are.
And at that time, Satan is going to be there because he, after he's delivered from this bottomless pit, loose for a little season, verse number 10 of the chapter 20 tells us he's going to be cast into the lake of fire where he's going to be forever and ever. It's not, it's not a game. It's a real place. And people are going there. Now come, come back to verse number 3. Revelation 20, verse number 3. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more. Now listen, this is a very sad commentary on the folly of men. The implication here is that even with the Lord Jesus Christ reigning and with all the rich pleasures of the millennium in full bloom, if Satan were present, men would fall for his deceptions. Now, you say, ah, there, ain't, there is no way that... Listen, it happened in the Garden of Eden. It happened in the Garden of Eden. At whether, and listen, Adam and Eve, didn't, they were not even born with a sin nature. <laughs> we, were born, we were born with a sin nature. Can you imagine how, how quickly... I, mean, it, it, I, don't know how quick, I don't know how quick Adam and Eve fell. I don't think it was long. I, I don't think it was very long. Be a horrible thing. Look, look at verse number three. We'll, we'll continue here. And cast him on the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should not deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Now, I'm going to read something here and, and I'm going to close at the end of this. I have a lot more stuff, but I knew I wasn't going to get through today anyway. But here, the Bible says that he's going to be loosed for a little season. Now, the question is, after all the damage that Satan has already done, and after all the destruction that we know that he's capable of, why, why in the world is he going to be loosed again for a little season after he is bound for this thousand years? Well, I, I don't have all the answers for that, that's for sure. But the devil claims that all the problems upon the earth are man, and man claims that all the problems on this earth is because of the devil, and the Lord's going to allow you and I to see that the devil is not our only problem. Without the devil's influence in your life, your flesh is wicked. And the millennium's going to prove that to a great extent. Now, I want you to turn to Zechariah chapter 14, and I want to read some scripture about events happening during the millennium. We think about this millennium. And, and listen, it's going to be wonderful. I don't mean to indicate to you at all. I mean, it's going to be fantastic for us that know the Lord, that's for sure. Now, in this church age, we're going to be ruling and reigning with the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't have all the information of what all that's going to entail. I got some ideas, but I couldn't say for 100%. I know exactly what all of that is. But I know for the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ today, it's going to be a great thing for us. I'm excited about it. But look at, look at, let's read some scripture about some events that are going to be happening during the millennium. Look in, look in Zechariah chapter 14 and look at verse number 16. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations. Now, I thought about this this morning. I was reading over my notes again this morning. I wonder which nations are going to be left. I wonder how many nations are going to be left. I I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I don't see. I don't really see the United States anywhere in those end time prophecies. But anyway, so and it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which come against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of Hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So during the millennium, there's going to be a yearly time of worship again. The Feast of Tabernacles is going to be reinstated. Look at verse number seventeen. And it shall be that whosoever will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. So during this millennial kingdom, there's going to be some nations. The Bible specifically talks about here. Um, the, the Egypt, it mentions here in just a moment in verse number 18. But these families that don't come up to Jerusalem to worship the king, they ain't going to get any rain. And he goes on to say in verse number 18, And if the family of Egypt go not up, and come not that have no rain, well, if, if, you know, if not having any rain doesn't do them, there shall be the plague, 
wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So here we have, during this millennial reign, there's going to be nations, there's going to be individuals. They'll not come up to worship the king. The Bible says there's not going to be any rain for that nation. If that continues, there's going to be a plague, and they're going to be killed because they, the, it's going to be the punishment of all nations that come not to keep the feast of the tabernacles. So God shows to mankind that even without the presence of Satan's, people still do not want the Lord Jesus Christ to rule over them. They're interested in self-will. I want to do what I want to do. I've, I've said it a million times. My problem is me. And your problem is you. Yes, sir. And we need to surrender to God's will, put our faith and our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, verse number 4 of Revelation 20 begins to talk about the thrones, and we'll talk about them next time. But listen, I want to encourage you this morning. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you need to know that today. Amen. We have, we have no promise of tomorrow. You have no promise of tomorrow. I have no promise of tomorrow. The Bible says that today is the day of salvation, and now is the accepted time. You need to know Jesus Christ today. And if you don't, I'd encourage you to know him before this day is over. Hey, Brother Kyle, for just a few minutes, if you come, and he'd like to play something on the piano this morning. I want to encourage you this